Beethoven's cycle of 32 sonatas for the piano has been called by Hans von Bülow the New Testament of the pianist, the Old Testament being the collection of 48 preludes and fugues, the well-tempered clavier by Bach. And these two cycles, these two collections, are like two pillars, monumental towers of repertoire, not just for the piano, but in music literature in general. And at least from Beethoven's side, I can say without any doubt that this is one of the greatest gifts which Beethoven has given humanity as an artist and to us pianists for performing. The cycle is fascinating in that it is a mirror of Beethoven's development throughout most of his creative life. The first sonatas were written when Beethoven was just 24, 25, having already conquered Vienna as a virtuoso and improviser and making his first steps towards fame as a composer as well. And until almost not quite the last years of his life, but just five years before his death, when he wrote the last three sonatas, Opus 109, 110, 111, exploring such distant musical worlds that nobody has tread before, capturing them, capturing their transcendent beauty and depth in notes so that we may explore them as well for centuries ever after. So to follow the cycle of sonatas, it is to follow Beethoven on his path of his path of creative development as a genius, as a composer. And it is wonderful to see Beethoven giving the same kind of love, attention, care, the utmost power of his inspiration and genius to each one of the sonatas. Not just the ones we give nicknames to and the ones which we think of first when we think of the cycle of sonatas, be it the darkness of the pathetique, or the moonlight, or the appassionata, These and the other nicknamed sonatas, Waldstein, the Hammer Clavier, the Tempest, the Pastoral, are undoubtedly the high points of what is an incredible cycle. But I would say that it is just as interesting and just as soul enriching and rewarding to explore the musical worlds of the other sonatas, the ones that connect these tips of the iceberg into one unifying whole which shows us Beethoven the man, Beethoven, the creator, throughout all stages of his career. And even in the smallest sonatas, like the one Opus 49, which quite probably he never meant to be published at all, we still feel the same love and attention bestowed by Beethoven on the music. So from that point of view, there are no weak points in the cycle. Even what some commentators might call the weakest sonata, number 22, which was the least loved by critics. Uh, critics wrote things like, we can see broad brush strokes, but no portrait emerges, and such other things. Even that sonata is fascinating and enigmatic and really interesting to explore, listen, and play. So, as I, I, as I would say, no weak points, just highest points and high points around them. We often speak about the three periods of Beethoven's creative life. Early Beethoven in Vienna, full of exuberance, uh, self-assured virtuosity, sometimes even cockiness, perhaps owing to the fact that he was widely acknowledged to be one of the, if not the greatest keyboard players of his time, of his generation. Then the heroic, um, period full of struggle, uh, the period of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth symphony, so on, covering such sonatas as the Waldstein, the, well, the, the, the moonlight in the beginning of that middle period, the Appassionata, of course, and then his most transcendent late period, where he really went so far ahead of us, as I mentioned, exploring territories nobody has 
trod before. So does this division really work in the sonata cycle? And the answer is yes and no. I would say for me, uh, perhaps a clear transition point from early to middle would be between sonatas 11 and 12, which indeed is somewhere between the first third and second third of sonatas. So what is this um, breaking or transition point? Sonata number 11 is some kind of summarizing chapter. It is a wonderful work full of sunshine and bravura and energy. <laughs> It is written on a grand scale, four movements, almost like a concerto in miniature. And then when we get to sonata number 12, written not, uh, not a long time after sonata number 11, there is a very subtle yet tangible change. It is the change of emotions stopping being described and the beginning of emotions being captured and presented to us in notes. I'll try to explain what I mean. It's the difference between theatrical emotion or emotion which is signaled to us that look, this is drama, look, this is happiness, look, this is joy. And instead, we are confronted with the emotion itself. And it is Beethoven's genius which allowed him, especially from that point on, step by step, to capture emotions more and more nuanced, more and more multi-layered, complex, and more and more difficult to describe. Because when emotions are signaled, as I said, it's quite easy to say, ha, ah, this, is, this, is, um, this is drama this is passion, this is sadness, this is joy. But when you start finding emotions which are more reflective of our true emotions that are also complex and multi-layered, then all of a sudden finding single word adjectives that would describe the entire sonata doesn't work anymore. And this is indeed what happens in Beethoven's music. The more we go with time and with the progression of sonatas, the harder it is to say this sonata is energetic or this sonata is um, full of bravura. Yes, this might be the case, but more often than not, we need a whole other complement of words and adjectives to more precisely describe what we are hearing. And by the time we get to the late sonatas, the last five, the emotions captured are of such exquisite complexity that the only way to really describe them is by playing them because no combination of words can really capture everything which they present. And for me it is this transition between sonata number 11 and sonata number 12 which at least in retrospect looking from the rest of the cycle backwards we can perhaps see there and then in the sonatas number 13 and 14 14, the moonlight, and, and then also the beginning of the pastoral, number 15. They all for me come from the same desire to capture life more truthfully. And this is perhaps the better way of putting it, not just capturing emotions, but capturing life which includes these emotions, but also includes nature, includes us as human agents, as human actors on this stage of life. And this is something which Beethoven does more and more as time progresses with the sonatas. And what about the second transition between middle and late Beethoven? I'd say this is a little bit more tricky to define because we find moments of transcendence and it is usually transcendent beauty, transcendent depth which we associate with late Beethoven. We find moments of that already in sonata number 24, Athérèse, we find moments of that 
um, already in Sonata 27. Uh, These are technically still not late period, they still belong technically to the middle period, or perhaps even more than that, the absolutely amazing opening of Sonata number 28. This also belongs um, to the middle period in, in theory. But for me, the transcendence is already there. Then we have the Hammerklavier. The Hammerklavier, Sonata number 29, is... If we treat the entire cycle as a journey around the world, then the Hammerklavier is like climbing the Everest. Both as a challenge for Beethoven, as a compositional challenge. It took him over a year to compose it and he wrote nothing else in that time. And to perform it, it is by far the most difficult and complex of all the 32 sonatas. So we could say that even though elements of his late style already appeared earlier on, the hammer clavier is our breaking point. It is as if having passed through this titanic struggle of that one work, the gates opened, the horizon opened, and everything became possible to him. And from that point on, the late period really starts and then we have the last three sonatas belonging to the late period but of course also the ninth symphony the diabelli variations the misa solemnis and foremost of all the late and last string quartets which were his perhaps greatest last compositions surpassing even the last sonatas in this exploration of worlds which no one has imagined before so perhaps there, between Sonata 28 and 29, we can uh, have our line leading into the late period and the three unique musical worlds, which are the last three sonatas. Another fascinating, though perhaps more mundane kind of um, development within the cycle is the range of the keyboard, which Beethoven had. He, throughout his entire life, was unhappy with keyboards. He was unhappy with the pianoforte, the kind of early piano which was extant at his early years, the piano which Mozart was completely satisfied with, or at least we do not feel in Mozart's compositions that he is unsatisfied with. But um, Beethoven, already from the first sonata, um, we get this feeling that he is trying to break through the barrier of the keyboard. So his keyboard at the time was from this F to this F. And he constantly writes at the edges, including some very dramatic chordal passages. <laughs> sort of, and this repeated um, insistence just at the edge of the keyboard. That would be the equivalent of us playing this chord multiple times again and again in fortissimo as if saying this is not enough. And people sometimes say that he used to write these passages because he was deaf and he needed high notes to be able to hear uh, still something of the music. But here we have it already in his first sonata, ages, years before he started losing his hearing. And already there we feel very strongly his dissatisfaction with the range of the piano. And not just the range, the body and the fullness of sound of the piano was also not to his liking. You always have a feeling that his imagination was ahead of piano builders at the time. And he did pester those piano builders for more. He wanted more notes, he wanted more body to the sound, he wanted more volume, he wanted the sound to be louder, he wanted more dynamic range, so he wanted the soft bits to be even softer. And piano builders gave it to him to such an extent that we can trace the development of the piano keyboard by the highest and lowest note which Beethoven used in any particular sonata. And because the sonatas cover such a long period of time and there are almost no gaps in them, uh, he wrote them almost every year, there are a few short gaps in the cycle, but not many, 
that we can say that, ah, okay, he starts going, instead of to the F, he starts going to the C, uh, for example, by the time of the, of the Waldstein, so it means he finally had up to the C. He starts going to the E, he got a few more uh, notes more on the top of the keyboard. And interestingly, it was the upper part of the keyboard which had most of the attention, and only when he was 47, around the time of Sonata 28-29, did he get an instrument from Thomas Broadwood, an English piano builder, which had finally also extra notes on the bottom, because the bottom stayed stuck on this F for all these 47 years of Beethoven's life. And only then he got a few more notes at the bottom, getting to the C. And this was such a cause of for excitement that Sonata number 28 is built like a huge build-up towards a climax on the dominant chord, which is E major, and the finale is a fugue in the middle section, and the fugue has its theme, which is and then in the climax this theme is hammered out in the left hand fortissimo, in um, double augmentation, so four times as slow. Each time supported by this low E, which was the first time ever that he had it. And just to, to as a proof that he did it on purpose, he was so obsessed with this one extra note, note which he got, that we find in his manuscripts him scribbling it over and over again to make sure he got the number of ledger lines correctly. And he insisted, moreover, that the publisher write in the score contra e, that the name of this note, to make sure that nobody thought this was a mistake. So this was what one extra note could do to Beethoven, could prove inspiration for writing a whole sonata centered around the climax, including this note like a rare ingredient or spice. And I would say, of course it is impossible to prove, that Beethoven would find our instruments quite a bit to his liking. Or perhaps he would even find them unsatisfactorily and maybe he would keep pushing. Maybe if Beethoven were alive today we wouldn't have had just 88 notes, maybe he would have wanted more. Impossible to say. But this idea of the piano becoming more robust and more full-bodied and also bigger is present throughout the sonata cycle. But even in the early sonatas, we can feel often him thinking in orchestral terms, um, thinking in thick textures, chords, thick chords, melodies not written as one voice but doubled in octaves, um, uh, textures like, like this. is almost like a bassoon playing the uh, lower part and other woodwinds or strings carrying the melody. This is from sonata number four or the slow movement of sonata number two, the same thing. This time maybe this is not a bassoon but pizzicati in the celli basses. And it is perhaps also interesting to see that when he did become deaf, his imagination in some ways got liberated. And some of the soundscapes which he created in the last sonatas, in sonata number 32, for example, is almost something which needed him not to be chained anymore to any physical, real instrument, but having an imaginary instrument in his head. Beethoven, of course, is inseparably tied to the piano. The piano was his instrument, and uh, we often find, especially in the early sonatas, that it was him simply showing off bravura, like saying, look at what I can do. Um... <laughs> simple, unclouded, 
joy in the visceral act of piano playing. And this is something which also remained with him throughout the cycle to the opening of the Hammer Club. <laughs> just the joy of having the entire instrument resonate with the chords. So this element of viscerality is also there. But another element which is perhaps a little bit overlooked is his quest for lyrical beauty. And this is something which for me, exploring the cycle of sonatas, was one of the greatest revelations. That already in the first sonata, he would write something like this. Something of such beauty and such poetry and such lyricism. This is not something which we immediately associate with Beethoven, but actually it is perhaps more a part of him than the drama, the darkness and the passion, because this kind of music is found almost in any sonata, from the first until the last, whereas the passion and the drama and darkness are just reserved to a few special ones. So this is something to look for while exploring the cycle. And the last thing I would like to say is when we look at the cycle in general it is sometimes easy to feel a bit lost. How do we explore the sonatas if we don't know them all? Because 32 is a lot, it is more than 10 hours of music and there's really a lot happening. So my humble advice would be do not get intimidated by the sheer scope of the cycle. Every sonata by Beethoven is a musical world self-contained with its own narrative, its own color, its own mood, its own aftertaste. And every one of these worlds, as I said, is really worth exploring. And sometimes it's nice just to take one sonata and listen to it a few times, maybe listen to different interpretations. Maybe if you play the piano yourself, take the score and read through the music. And you will discover that every one of these sonatas is so rewarding. Not just in retrospect, not just saying, ah, this is Beethoven achieving this kind of revolutionary advancement, but more maybe like Beethoven di himself did. When he was writing each one of these sonatas, he didn't know which sonatas he would write in two or three times. As a quick example, the sonata number five in C minor is sometimes called the small pathetic because it is also in C minor like the pathetic and it is also dramatic like the pathetic. But two years separate the sonata and the pathetic, two years in which he has written quite a few things and it seems to me quite unlikely that he knew at that time that he would write the pathetic and this wasn't in any sense an exercise towards the pathetic. And by calling it the small pathetic, we immediately establish a kind of relationship of, okay, the pathetic is the important one, and this is like a mini version of it. Whereas nothing could be farther from truth. Uh, Sonata number five is a fascinating world in itself. It has a 12 minute long slow movement of exquisite, magical, enchanted beauty, even more than the pathetic has. It has a um, finale of white knuckle boiling energy, even more than the pathetic has. What it doesn't have is the depth, perhaps, and the darkness of the introduction of the pathetic. That indeed is something where the pathetic went forward. Or the catchiness of the opening theme of the pathetic when we get to the fast tempo. But it is definitely a world worth exploring for itself and not for its position in front of the pathetic. So, in the same way, there is a reason to explore each one of the sonatas. From the first one, the first one already, uh, the first three sonatas, they were not early works. He was already 25 by that point, and they were his calling card in Vienna as a composer. And he took great care in selecting works which reflected the very best that he could do at the time. So that would be my um, idea of approaching the cycle, finding each sonata, a musical world in itself, and exploring it for itself. And then, 
all of a sudden you will see that you've explored all 32 of these worlds and then you will i believe gain an insight into beethoven's life character and genius like through nothing else perhaps you will see not just the lyrical beauty and the passion but also another thing which i discovered while working through the cycle this unstoppable life energy which suffuses his music no matter how hard his own life was and we know that he suffered many hardships personal health hardships of course the deafness but also circumstances of life around him and yet every time he came fighting back and this is something which is strongly felt in the music and which makes the cycle an incredible companion for our and all times thank you